To open the next session, please welcome Ms. Cecilia Pahe, President of the Philippine Oncology Nurses Association and Clinical Department Manager of the Cancer Center, Bone Marrow Transplant Unit and Pain Management Service at Makati Medical Center, Philippines. Our next session is a series of lectures. The first lecture is entitled, Quality Assurance and Patient-Centered Multidisciplinary Care, Sharing Experience from a Developing Country. Our speaker is Dr. Bilal Mazar Qureshi, Asian Oncology Society Counselor and Senior Instructor at the Department of Oncology in the Aga Khan University, Pakistan. His research interests are gynecologic tumors, genitourinary tumors, and GI tract malignancies. The next lecture is entitled, Effective Communication and Right to Information, Challenges Faced in Physician-Patient Relationship in Cancer Care in Low- and Middle-Income Countries. Our speaker is Dr. Nasim Bigam, Asian Oncology Society Counselor and a researcher with a special interest on breast cancer. She was the founding president of Radiation Oncology Society of Pakistan and former president of the Radiological Society of Pakistan. The last lecture is entitled, Setting Up Palliative Care in a Comprehensive Cancer Care Center. Our speaker is Dr. Sudip Shrestha, Asian Oncology Society Counselor and Executive Chairman of Nepal Cancer Hospital and Research Center. He was the founding president of Nepalese Association of Palliative Care and Nepal Cancer Support Group and founder member of OM Health Foundation. He worked as the medical director and HOD of Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our distinguished speakers, Drs. Bilal Mazar Qureshi, Nasim Bigam, and Sudip Shrestha. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Bilal. I'm from Aachan University Hospital, Karachi, and I'll be sharing my institutional experience of quality assurance and patient-centered care in Karachi, Pakistan on behalf of my institute. So as you may already be knowing that there is a disparity of availability of radiotherapy resources across the globe, having higher provision in the upper higher income countries and uh, in South Asia as compared to East Asia because of having um, limited resources. If we talk about Pakistan, most of the institute in the country uh, are, uh, which are offering services to cancer patients uh, are under uh, the auspices of Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission. And if you look at the comparison of availability of radiotherapy machines to what is available in the lower middle income countries and higher income countries, we see disparity as we show in, uh, in the map early on in my presentation. And the same is the case for Pakistan, which along with other developing countries still have high number of cobalt units and still lagging behind in the availability of manpower, trained manpower in the country for uh, as far as the radiation therapy trained personnel are required. So the place uh, where we work at includes uh, four linear accelerator along with a conventional simulator uh, and a PET CT simulator, a gamma med uh, HDR after loader for brachytherapy and uh, the manpower includes six radiation oncologists, seven medical physicists, 15 radiation therapy technologists and four radiation therapy nurses offering around 900 patients uh, with radiation therapy a year and crossing more than 150,000 patients in 2006 having 
and internal quality assurance mechanism with third party accreditation from joint commission and accreditation and international which is the north american organization for quality assurance certification and we are involved in offering two dimensional three dimensional treatments learning as well as imrt and more recently volumetric arc therapy for up to 90 patients uh, on cold linux daily so the unique services that are offered by our uh, department which is not very common in the region include daily peer review radiation therapy planning radiation therapy and the general anesthesia total body irradiation interstitial brachytherapy services with pet ct based planning total skin electron therapy for uh, patients with mycosis fungoides and offering imrt to up to more than 60 percent patients and maintaining quality through daily qa of the treatment plan double check before starting any new treatment uh, doing a weekly checks and maintaining the availability of phase 2 and phase 3 plan while the patient is seen initially and some of the newer things like placement of additional marker for prostate cancer patient so among the various steps involved in the radiation treatment planning and delivery the quality is assured for treatment through peer review of all the plan which are done by the radiation on colleges double check by the clinical medical physicist before the file is delivered to the linear accelerator for treatment delivery and on treatment qa of all the treatment uh, parameters by the radiation therapy technology so for quality assurance of treatment planning and delivery it's not only the availability of good quality machine which is required we need uh, good methodology system and having adequately trained manpower which includes not only the doctors but also clinical medical physicists and radiation therapy technologists and most importantly for developing country where the availability of vendor is not there so biomedical engineers there are certain system which are uh, necessarily required for maintaining quality for the patient we include accreditation of the services learning from your own mistakes doing a peer review of your plan that you offer to the patient discussing every patient in tumor both before uh, embarking on the treatment plan and very very important is learning from your own mistakes the reporting of the downtime of the uh, machine or whatever equipment or software you have and then discussing in your quality improvement committee to till day to help improve the services and avoid problems later on so if we talk about the personal and oncology practice and obviously not only limited to the radiation oncologists but also to the other three groups that we just talked about we need to have a strong uh, component of administrative uh, learning research and teaching so in our practice especially in the developing countries many at times we are more involved in clinical work or administrative tasks and not giving enough time to teaching and research which we propose to be equally important in our professional development so moving forward i would be sharing with you the experience of our site specific radiation oncologists with the various faculty members involved in different sites of the disease so our facility offers various educational program uh, along with the radiation therapy uh, technology two year certification program and the two year medical physics uh, training program which is an, on an institutional uh, basis a diploma actually what we call this and we have have the number of exits which are involved in giving patient care and services to different centers in the world in in the city i mean so these uh, trainees are involved uh, during the uh, association with the department with different directive tasks projects presentation and uh, mandatory rotation which may sometimes are overlapping between the two program and talking about the radiation uh, oncology residency training program which actually overlaps with the college of physician and surgeons of pakistan program that is four years by the cpsp and five years by our university 
only the first batch graduated in 2012 and at the time there are eight trainees who perform different on-service tasks and are involved in some didactic academic sessions with an extensive schedule displayed here. So it is actually a learning objective based study plan where the students submit their uh, learning objective to the faculty after doing a structured topic review and further on are elaborated and resolved through contemporary literature in critical appraisal sessions. So this is a guide uh, for self-structured study plan uh, incorporating various aspects of training and uh, apprenticeship uh, type uh, clinical aspects of the training and uh, emphasizing upon not only the core curriculum of learning oncology and radiation oncology and treatment planning skills, but also emphasizing upon the learning of the managerial skill development during the duration of training at Aachen University Hospital in Karachi. And the residents are required to submit a academic portfolio uh, on a three monthly basis. And uh, also they are involved in additional learning objectives, which actually involves uh, patient-centered uh, tasks, which are not obviously in the curriculum, but are on interest based of the resident. And most of these people have uh, chosen uh, something which have benefited uh, the patients in general through our, the training of the professional, like Dr. Munibuddin Karim has worked on this blog for making available a lot of resources for the oncology trainees and practitioners in the country and Dr. Hamad Khan incorporating his skills into the education of undergraduate students at various medical schools in Karachi for uh, emphasis on tumor growth establishment and forming a student chapter for uh, facilitation of tumor growth at these institutes. So, here we talk about just radiotherapy or oncology in general or quality radiation therapy. Some of the uh, aspects that I've already talked about and uh, sharing all these examples, it's just a thought for all of us that when do we change uh, our perspective and our efforts for better care in the developing countries for our colleagues. So do we need a lot of money for it? What we propose is to optimize available resources and do whatever uh, we can within our limit without asking for more money. Obviously money is important for machines and uh, paying the salaries, but there's a lot more that we can do as I'll be showing further. So over the years, Hafan University Hospital has developed uh, multiple site specific tumor boards, uh, 26 up till now. Many of them are still on uh, a monthly or a fortnightly basis, but the success uh, is that some of the pediatric tumor boards are uh, routinely done with different and uh, between different institutes where all the patients are discussed from Intestinal Cancer Hospital as well as NICH. And obviously, all the tumor boards are open to other uh, healthcare professionals from any country in the country. And uh, in the era of COVID-19, uh, most of the, all these tumor boards have been converted into Zoom link where anybody can join and register their cases to be discussed with by the experts. And then also publishing mm -hmm. uh, and sh sharing our perspective that for developing countries, for uh, countries like South Asian countries, you know, both are a lifeline for our cancer patients in low and middle income countries. Sharing the example of City Tumor Board, which is non-institutional, non-territorial, established in 2010, uh, where doctors, specialists from different hospitals uh, get together on a Sunday morning on a fortnightly basis to discuss the cases from those hospitals where the oncology or multidisciplinary services are not uh, yet available and of course converted into a hybrid meeting in during COVID-19 and the same for peer review uh, 
uh, three to five cases are discussed for revision planning, control evaluation, having uh, an overall change rate of 22% in our practice and also published in ESCO publication last year in Journal of Global Oncology 2019, August. So, steering aspect of my own uh, pediatric site specific service, which incorporates a lot of uh, technical challenges, which are different from what we do for adults. Anesthesia is one of them where you have to make available the IV line for all the patients. Uh, uh, gases for anesthetic agent, different type of air maintaining gadgets, and a lot of supporting staff uh, consuming higher number of uh, treatment slots uh, as compared to the adults, uh, and of course, uh, catering the needs of specialist anesthesiologists and making their availability during the treatment. Uh, delivery. So, sharing the example of pediatric oncology in Pakistan, which has come a long way from uh, not having any expert center, and now the Pakistan Society of Pediatric Oncology moving on to develop national treatment protocols. Uh, at least four of them are ready up till now, and our radiation oncology colleagues from the country getting involved in international recommendation for improvement of quality in uh, pediatric radiation therapy in the developing countries uh, and suggesting changes which are not required with minimal or no resources and also the faculty from the university getting involved in the study, international study groups and publishing with the Pediatric Radiation Oncology Society International colleagues. So another example of uh, of it, Optimizing available resources. It started in 2014 with email communication with faculty from the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto, uh, developing into monthly uh, pediatric neuro oncology tumor board, and now, which is now a full uh, project for uh, capacity building of pediatric neuro oncology across Pakistan, where special leads from different specialities like pediatric oncology, geneticist, surgeon, histopathologist, palliative care physician, radiation oncologist, and nursing colleagues are uh, making their efforts to develop neuro-oncology expertise in the country. Multiple workshops have been done over uh, uh, over last one and a half years, and during the pandemic, they have been converted into video-linked lectures by international faculty, which are not only attended by experts in Pakistan, but also by experts, from, uh, by, uh, by learners from all related speciality in different countries through Zoom video link and then taking the lead at an international arena for pediatric oncology, different experts from Pakistan participating in various uh, meetings across the globe and pioneers exchange program is one of the examples which is between Pakistan and Italy, the Akhan University in Karachi and Catholic University in uh, Rome, uh, where multiple doctors from Rome have been trained at Akhan University in Karachi and then playing a role at a national level through planning workshops, building up collegiality and team building, different radiation therapy workshops have been organized over the year through mutual learning and this has resulted in collegiality and, and emphasizing more towards the learning during the pandemic and sorry for this uh, typo in the video but various sessions have been arranged during the pandemic to continue the learning and efforts of various faculty across the country. So up till now, uh, last updated till August 2020, 76th cited publication by our institute with multiple international linkages which have been beneficial in improving services for cancer patients in the country as well as educating others in the national policy. And our national uh, colleagues, these are some of the international associations that we are linked with. And with the bottom of our heart, we thank you for listening to me in this talk. And we can uh, are always open for room for improvement. And 
will welcome suggestions from your side. This is the aerial view of Aachen University Hospital in Karachi, Pakistan at Stadium Road. Here you see the nice cricket ground, which is the national stadium for cricket. And here is the whole of Aachen University Hospital campus. Thank you so much for paying attention to this presentation. I hope that we all keep on learning from this COVID-19 pandemic, the way it has transformed the education and clinical practice. We, by sharing our experience during this conference, will be able to make a better plan for our patients and provide best possible services to our patients and develop professionally much better. Thank you so much. Please stay safe. Dear colleagues, hello. I am Dr. Naseem Begum from Pakistan. First of all, I would like to thank the Scientific Committee of First Asian Oncology Conference for giving me this opportunity to talk to you on the critical subject of the role of effective communication in patient-physician relationship in cancer care and challenges faced by the low and middle income countries in this context. As we all know that communication is the art and heart of medicine. The term communication has been derived from the Latin word communis, that means common or to share. What is communication? It is the process of meaningful exchange of information between two people or a group of people. The process of communication consists of three components. One, a sender, a message, and a recipient. The recipient can be one or more than one. The sender encodes the message in words or in writing and sends it through some channel, that is the writing or the speech, to the recipient. The recipient records the uh, message and send back the feedback to the sender. There can be many barriers to the whole of this process. For the communication to be effective, the person whom you are talking to listens actively, absorbs your point, and understands it. The purpose of effective communication is the right to information and informed consent. By the right to information, we mean the information about the patient's health, information about the treatment and interventions available, and information given in such a way that the patient can understand it. Well, informed consent is the cornerstone of the medical decision making. It requires an honest and truthful communication between the oncologist and the patients. This communication causes some tension in the patient-physician relationship but finally, it results in developing a trusted relationship. Misunderstanding can occur at any stage of the communication process. Effective communication involves minimizing potential misunderstanding and overcoming any barriers to the communication at each stage in the communication process. There are many barriers to the effective communication in healthcare in general and cancer healthcare in particular. A skilled communicator must be aware of these barriers and try to reduce their impact by continuously checking, understanding, and offering appropriate feedback. There are many barriers to the effective communication in patient-physician relationship. These barriers are social-cultural, psychological, uh, physical. Looking at the social-cultural barriers, the norms of social interaction may differ greatly in different cultures. To talk about cancer is still considered to be a taboo in low and middle income countries. Considering the gender inequality, the females are not allowed to speak. Language differences and difficulty in understanding unfamiliar accents are other barriers. The psychological barriers are self-explanatory, that is stress, anger and fear, and low self-esteem. Looking at the physical barriers, disabilities in speech and hearing, 
lack of attention, distraction or irrelevance to the recipient. Communication is generally easier over shorter distances as more communication uh, channels are available and less technology is required. Ideal communication is face to face. Power relationship between the patient and the physician is a very cri uh, critical factor in uh, clinical practice. There is gross imbalance in power relationship between the patient and the physician most of the time in LMICs. The ethical effectiveness of a clinical system, clinical health system is maximized by empowering doctors and the patients to develop an adult adult rather than adult child relationship. There is good evidence that the attitudinal barriers are hindering pro progress in implementing shared decision making. Even when the patients are well informed, many find it difficult to use this knowledge to participate meaningfully in decisions about the health care. Patients and families often hold back from openly engaging clinicians in the thorough discussions that true shared decision making requires. It is true that even the doctors are not immune to this power imbalance when they become patients, feeling that they represent disease rather than they are an individual and are aware of the pressure to be compliant and passive. Attitudinal changes are important before we make attempt to support the shared decision making process. The oncologists in the low and middle income countries, especially in the public sector, have to deal with heavy load of patients. In a research study carried out in Pakistan, 57% oncologists in the public sector gave less than 7 minutes to cancer patient, which is surely not enough to build up meaningful relationship based on communication. Even when communicating in the same language, the terminology used in a message can act as a barrier if not fully understood by the receiver. For example, a message that includes a lot of specialist jargons, abbreviations, will not be understood by the receiver who is not familiar with the terminology. The relationship built <coughs> through patient-physician communication is an integral part of the clinical practice. When carried out well, such communication produces a therapeutic effect for the patient and this has been validated in various control studies. Over the last two decades, there has been a changing pattern of patient-physician relationship. From paternalistic, it has gone over to the shared decision making. Patient desires increased participation and information about the diagnosis, treatment options, risks, and benefits of treatment options and prognosis. WHO has identified four models of patient-physician interaction. The paternalistic model. In the paternalistic model, the physician acts as the patient guardian, articulating and implementing what is best for the patient. As such, the physician has obligations including that of placing the patient's interest above his or her own and soliciting the views of others when lacking adequate knowledge. In the informative model, the objective of the patient-physician interaction is the physician is to provide the patient with all the relevant information. The patient selects the medical intervention he or she wants and for the physician to execute the selected interventions. The interpretive model. In this model, the aim of the physician-patient interaction is to elucidate the patient's values and what he or she actually wants and to help the patient select the available medical interventions that realize these values and needs. In the deliberative model, the physician acts as a teacher or a friend engaging the patient in a dialogue on what course of action would be the best. Considering the social, cultural and the healthcare environment of a middle income country like Pakistan, the issues in the context of communication were framed under the heading of social, health systems, medical and human resource. This framework was used uh, to study the prevailing communication practices between physicians 
that is the radiation oncologist and clinical oncologist in this case and the cancer patients. To identify social priorities, inequalities and power relationship among them in the prospects of patient right to information and democratic decision making. And to evolve for the future guidance recommendations for a national cancer communication strategy based on the findings. This research work was published in 2017 and is available on the research gate. The general challenges emerging out of this research work were lack of education, poverty, financial difficulties, expensive treatment, language barriers, travel distances, cancer care, giving information uh, to the patient, lack of awareness, patient burden, and time scarcity. Looking at the specific challenges, these were the information provided through mail because of the gender inequality, the females, they are not allowed to speak. Patient approach when in the late stages, compliance to treatment is low, counseling services are not available, patient burden is high in the public se sector especially, patient morale is important, late stage patient with limited survival and female patient concerns with the privacy. How to resolve these challenges? There are certain interventions which can be uh, suggested, like interventions in the medical setup, gaps in the curriculum regarding the communication skills at the undergraduate and the postgraduate level, and simplification of the scientific jargons per patient time allocation should be optimum, provide complete message or information. There is a need for capacity building on uh, regarding the human rights, protection of right to information, informed consent, and fulfillment of the medical ethics. Social and health interventions. We should encourage patient-to-patient -patient interaction, counseling, and the availability, accessibility, and affordability of the services. Recommendations for the cancer communication strategy. Creating a more equitable world for all, developing policies and legal frameworks, creating cancer awareness among masses and the cancer patients, and investing in cancer treatment and healthcare facilities. Investing in education, literacy, and health is also important. These are some of the guiding principles for developing cancer communication strategy in low and middle income countries. To conclude, I would like to say that participation of patients and physicians as partners for collaborative decision making will result in better compliance to the treatment and follow-up, better tolerance to the treatment side effects, and better quality of life and patient satisfaction. I would like to thank you for your time and patient listening. Greetings from Nepal. I am not here to disclose. My topic for today is setting up a palliative care service in a comprehensive cancer center. Next 20 minutes or so, I'll be discussing how to set up a palliative care service in a cancer hospital, especially in a resource limited setting. I'll be discussing this on the basis of our experience from our organization. Palliative care, it is a philosophy of care. It's a total care while the focus of care is on quality of life. This is a very, very common figure where the emphasis has been given that palliative care is not only the terminal care, it is a care which has to be included from the day one of the diagnosis of related disease like cancer or similar illness. Even ASCO has recognized palliative care and from 2012, integration of palliative care into a standard oncology care has been talked about. In 2016, it has come into its guideline. To start a palliative care program in a cancer hospital, scale up the service depends upon the requirement, available infrastructure, and resources. We can start small and we can grow bigger. Why to consider a hospital-based palliative care unit at all? There are many advantages. 
we can discuss in many perspectives. Let's see from the care perspective. It can be a part of comprehensive cancer care. It provides continuity of care within the same care setting. Having a palliative care service in a hospital, the transition of care becomes smoother from care to, to palliative. From the resource perspective, the most of the specialists, when they are under one roof, sharing of a common pool of manpower becomes easier. We can share common facilities and resources, thus reduction of the overall cost. The ultimate impact of having palliative care in a hospital is it shares a burden from the clinicians, the shift from the doctor-based practice to team-based practice. It increases patients and family satisfaction with the hospital services and builds a loyalty to the institution. It fosters goodwill and greater public involvement, but there are challenges. Existence of other areas of priority for the hospital and lack of knowledge amongst the medical professionals in the area of palliative care. Especially in low resource countries, there is always a lack of experts, lack of morphine, unrealistic fear regarding the use of morphine. There are lots of potential limitations as well. There's no autonomy. Having a palliative care service in a cancer hospital, when the patient comes for treatment in a bigger hospital, most of the time, there is a challenges. Unrealistic expectation is a very common problem. So sometimes it can cause conflict. There can be resentments from the staff from other units. And there's always a fight for the adequate space. There are different models of palliative care, uh, care setups which we can start in a hospital. Number one is the OPT model. It's a low cost model. It's a both model to start especially if resource is limited. Experts can be a trained doctors or a nurse. Service can also extend to the inpatients whenever there is needed. Second is a daycare model. It could be extension of a consultation service. It's mainly for the daycare procedure and for the short observation and establishment. Third is a home care model. To those who cannot come to the hospital, to those who wants to have treatment in home, environment, we can give a continuity of care. This could be an extension of inpatient services. Inpatient model, whenever there is a dedicated patients or beds, wards, or dedicated staff, it becomes an inpatient model. And fifth is a comprehensive model. Basically, it is a palliative care program. It includes all the models. It offers the best possible care and it can be a demonstration unit, especially for education purpose. Now let's see how we can establish a palliative care setup, step by step. First and foremost is the commitment, the commitment from the higher management. There should be a clear vision, mission, and goal for the program. Need assessment has to be done, especially the number of the patients, type of the patients, type of service needed, infrastructure, and manpower. Third is a identification of team leader. It is a very important step. The success of palliative care depends upon the team leader. One should be not only a skilled clinician, but also a salesperson and good advocate. Fourth is a preliminary preparations. Promotion, the, promoting the palliative care concept to the key stakeholder like head of department, of other departments is very, very important. And we also do sensitization to the staff members for the philosophy and need for the palliative care. We should have a good budget to do all everything. Other important step is having a palliative care team. The most important team members are doctors and nurse. Other than that, we should have a huge number of other team members as well as a part of multidisciplinary team. There, we should have a very clear-cut document, documentations and documents. Job discussion has to be very, very clear for every staff members. We should have clear referral policies, procedure and workflow. And we should have a good 
patients and family education materials in the form of brochures and leaflets. Infrastructure has to be planned well. Which it should be accessible, aesthetically present and good ambience, comfortable and peaceful. Privacy has to be maintained. There should be enough space for entertainment, counseling room, prayers room, and even terminal care room. Other important step is ensuring the essential drug, especially the opioids and other. And all the rules and regulations has to be followed well whenever you deal with the, uh, drugs like opiate. There should be good uh, documentation and record keeping system. And we can expand the services in different area of palliative care like lymphedema clinic, stoma clinic, rehabilitation clinic, etc. Cholera operation has to be done very, very nicely. Cholera operation shouldn't limit only in the hospital, but cholera operation should be done outside the hospital as well with different NGOs, government, home care services, hospitals, hospices, corporate organization, etc. Education and advocacy is another area, which is a very, very important step. Sensitizations to public and policymakers about the palliative cure, so as to increase its adaptability to use and to bring the changes into government policy in favor of palliative care service in the country. Education monitoring, as so, I mean, evaluation and monitoring is also another important steps. Similarly, the quality assessment. With this all this background, let's see our experience of establishing a palliative care service in our cancer hospital. The background. In 2015, Nepal is a resource limited country. We had very few comprehensive cancer hospitals in the Nepal, no palliative care physician in the whole country. The care interest among the medical graduates for this faculty is almost non existence. No academic course, no post. Trained people are mostly nurses who have only limited influence in hospital management. Thus, one of the most neglected field. Nepal Cancer Hospital is one of the three comprehensive cancer hospital that time. It is situated in the capital city, Kathmandu. We are operational for the last five years. It is 100 bedded hospital, 600 plus staff, and we see more than 3,000 patients a year. From the very inception, as a part of comprehensive cancer center, we have planned to have a palliative care oncology as one of the important uh, branch. At the startup, we have established this as 10 bedded unit with 10 dedicated nurse and one coordinator and one co-coordinator. We have chosen one junior consultant medical oncologist who have interest in palliative care as a coordinator and one senior nurse in charge and train them, train her as a co-coordinator. The most important challenge that time we had to nurture the important steps the strategy which we have taken for this is that we have kept the palliative care unit under Department of Medical Oncology. This is because Department of Medical Oncology is one of the strongest department. As a team leader, as an executive chairman, I took the responsibility. And we have developed palliative care unit into palliative care program gradually. So we had a very clear vision, mission and goal we have a policy document in place. And as a, uh, as a team members, doctors, we have both full-time and part-time. In the full-time, we have dedicated palliative care physicians. And at part-time, we have intervention pain physicians and psychologists. And we have also other support team as a multidisciplinary team. As a nurse, we are very proud that we started for the first time in Nepal, the concept of specialist nurses. We have chosen a very competent nurses. We train them as a specialist nurse, and we have now five dedicated specialist nurses in palliative care: pain and palliative care nurse, home care nurse, psych oncology nurse, wound and stomach care nurse, and survivorship nurse. Specialist nursing aid is another concept we have applied in our hospital. We have chosen committed auxiliary nurse midwife, train them as a nursing aide, and we have appointed them to help our nursing team to take care of the 
palliative care patients in palliative care world. As a team, other team members, we have big team, both full-time and part-time. These are team members who are working in our hospital and as a multidisciplinary team. We have a very clear clinical guidelines laid up for day-to-day -day clinical management of the palliative care for the patients. And we have made all the drugs available 24 hours, seven days a week. We have followed all the national uh, rules and regulations for opiates. This is an opiate card patient has to bring to get the opi uh, opiates. This is a patient's information brochures. This is a different clinical documents, documents. And to recognize our palliative care in our hospital, we have been doing a lot of activities. For, for example, to establish, we have named our palliative care ward behind one legendary national figure. Similarly, we have been uh, celebrating every year at National Hospice Days, lots of fun raising activities, lots of interaction program, article writings. We have been doing workshops, seminars, and training programs in our palliative care courses. And our center has been recognized by the government to train uh, its uh, staff for palliative care. So we are also doing a few researches and are doing paper, uh, paper publications. The service we have in our hospital is pain and palliative care OPD, interventional pain clinic, psycho oncology clinic, inpatient ward, palliative care team for inpatient care, emergency 24 hours, seven, seven days a week, 24 hours in-house pharmacy, hotline phone, viral service for emergency, home care, outsource service, we have done MOU with a home care provider for pain patients needing home care service. And we have a specialty clinic like physiotherapy, stoma care, survivor safe clinic, etc. We also are having the program uh, for burnt out prevention uh, for, uh, and its management for the staff and caretaker. The referring criteria at our hospital is to we are trying to involve our palliative care uh, team as early as possible. The workflow is like whenever a palliative care team help is needed, it's been referred by the primary care physicians and the palliative, this palliative care team does a detailed work, uh, work up for the case and it identified issues and root causes and solutions. And it, it, it export, uh, they give their opinion to the primary care physicians. And uh, we discuss this in team. We planned our treatment and we discuss with the patients and family and we final, uh, uh, make we final plan of actions and we were in the team for further treatment plan. But as, a, as a team, we have a part of comprehensive cancer care and we work closely with the primary care physicians and make sure that patients and family are well taken care during the entire phase of cancer journey from diagnosis to survivorship, survivorship to end of life care. And this team is available 24 hours, seven days a week at the end. This is a one photo session when one of our patients' family came after the death of the patients and they have recognized, uh, they have given a token of love and this kind of scene is very common in our hospital. So at the end, for a successful palliative care program in a hospital, commitment from the higher management with a strong logistic support from the administration is a must. The system should be supported by all the senior stakeholders. Leader of the program should not only be a good clinician, but also a good advocate. The team should be well motivated and trained. It should be clear SOPs and workflow. The program should be dynamic and vibrant with plenty of academic and social activities to make it live lively. At the end, palliative care is not only a science, but service to a mankind as well. It should be a part of all the cancer hospitals. Thank you. Thank you for your kind attention. To facilitate the question and answer session, please welcome Dr. Rumeli Kervera, Vice Chairman and Medical Coordinator of the Supportive and Integrative Care at Asian Hospital and Medical Center. She is also the founding president and CEO of the Ruth Foundation for Palliative and Hospice Care, founding board member and current president of the Philippine Society of Palliative and Hospice Medicine, board member and secretary of the National Palliative and Hospice Care Council of the Philippines, and the representative of the Philippines in the Asia-Pacific Hospice Palliative Care Network Council. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Rumeli Curvera. Hello, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm coming through clear. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And while we learned uh, so much as we heard from our three distinguished presenters this evening, uh, I would like to just greet and thank uh, Dr. Bilal, doc Dr. Nasim, and Dr. Sudip, which I recall now um, I, yeah. we were together in ASCO yeah. uh, right. several years <laughs> back. It's such a pleasure to see you, sir, oh, and so to hear I. from you and for how you shared uh, what we actually learned also in ASCO about integration. And mom says, good evening po. Uh, good evening, thank you for me. Thank you for buddying up with me here in this, this portion. All right, so um, I believe we'll be uh, waiting for some questions from our audience. And, um, but offhand, um, there was already one question from the audience for Dr. Sudip, um, particularly. <clears throat> And this is uh, about during this pandemic and the extreme burnout among our healthcare workers and patients uh, was observed. Was the same observed among the palliative care programs in your country? And can you share some insights or uh, regarding your programs in your centers and what they may have experienced during this, this pandemic? Um, Dr. Thank Sidney? you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, thank you for the nice questions. In fact, uh, it's very, very true that uh, we encountered lots of uh, burnt out among our staff during this uh, pandemic. And it was uh, not only burnt out, it is uh, the fear, which is which was so common with the initial, initial phase of the pandemic with our, with our patients, because uh, the stress level which they had, it is not only from, uh, from the hospital and patients, but also from the even family members and society. And we had a very tough time to handle this. So for that, actually, we took the help of our nursing education department. And so through that department, we had to have lots of motivational classes, lots of lecture and other counselings to those staffs. Because initially, regarding Corona, the information is so uh, I mean, I mean the information regarding Corona is so um, so much that uh, they are so much confused what to do and what not to do. So we had a tough time, and uh, but now I think we have got away with this. So most important things is the counseling and uh, uh, for uh, and the ventilation of their feeling is the most important to get away uh, for their uh, this uh, kind of uh, stress. Yes. Yes, and thank you for pointing that out. Truly, um, the palliative care teams were very key in facilitating adequate information. And, and even as we heard from Dr. Nassim about the shared decision making, I think um, this was new knowledge that was really forced into practice, especially during this pandemic. And we've uh, been seeing a lot of that as well. Um, and of course, with that shared decision making comes the need for counseling and processing their their feelings when they hear about the certain difficult decisions they need to make, especially for our cancer patients. All right, thank you. Um, our uh, another question for for doc for Dr. Nassim here. Uh, oh wait, I'll move up a bit. There's one before that for Dr. Uh, Kureshi about MDT, sir. We were there, very thankful uh, for your how you shared um, the importance of. MDT, yes, we know it's really been a challenge, I think, especially through our, among our resource um, limited countries to really have this as part of standard cancer care. It's been a challenge, but yes, we see it's very key in, in standard, in good uh, patient-centered care. And um, the question here, though, is how did the pandemic affect the multidisciplinary team conferences in your country? Um, in what ways were you able to, to address the patient's needs uh, during this time, and what's your take on on telemedicine? So, did it work? The MDT were we able to do this virtually in your country, and and what's your take on on the telemedicine approach uh, um, of this MDT? 
Thank you, Dr. Mai, for uh, posting the question for me. I congratulate all the speakers for giving an ex uh, excellent talk and the organizer, again, for giving me a chance to highlight these uh, things which I just shared in my talk. Yes, this pandemic, COVID-19, has been very challenging for us, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we are fortunate and uh, I believe we are wiser that we learned a lot of more things uh, happening through video conferencing and uh, virtually uh, just like this meeting so we immediately uh, shifted uh, towards zoom link uh, or microsoft link on, on other platforms to, for having the multidisciplinary site specific tumor boards in our situation and uh, as far as our training program is concerned with sick kids and our outreach from Aachen University for pediatric neuro-oncology at different centers, it uh, continued, uh, it just switched into virtual uh, tumor board meetings where uh, although it has been a bit challenging, but at the same time, it was time efficient as well that uh, we, uh, some of the members who could not walk into the tumor board rooms uh, could join uh, and even the residents and the trainee to enhance their learning experience they could join from wherever they were uh, during the, uh, the, their work or when confined at home during quarantine or isolation as well could participate in these multidisciplinary meetings for the sake of patients and uh, yes uh, at our university as well and uh, the other centers in the country also adopted this approach of telemedicine during uh, during the pandemic of course uh, there was not a single day especially from radiation oncology point of view because as you all know that radiotherapy is a continuous treatment over a, a certain uh, period like five to six weeks in the curative setting and for head and neck up to seven weeks and prostate for eight weeks and uh, a stop or a hold in radiation treatment uh, could uh, impact the local control. Some of those patients were for adjuvant treatment. Of course, uh, now we have a lot of guidelines site specific again. And even for the pediatric tumor, we have fractionation guidelines from PSYOP Europe, which are available and which we also adopted into our practice. But yes, telemedicine uh, was initially done and uh, it could only be teleconsultation for radiation therapy because the patient had to come. And then we had to arrange all the SOPs for our staff, some of the experience that I would like to take here and uh, in this opportunity would be that uh, like uh, some of the patient who have the risk of aerosol generation, even with all the PPs of our radiation therapy technologies, the head and neck patients uh, were switched on uh, to and clumped to a single machine at a specific time. So things like that. Uh, uh, it was not very much acceptable for the patients to have teleconsultation, but then uh, we were able to reach out for the patients for consultation uh, who could not come to the clinics. And then, of course, a triage for radiation treatment for whom we could delay and for whom we need to proceed urgently and having uh, alternate strategies for palliative treatments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hireshi. And yes, um, as you said, we we have found that uh, although that we can easily now come together because there's no reason that there's no traffic, there's no the, the transportation cost because we now have these virtual uh, platforms. But at the same time, we've seen ourselves busy because we now have a new act way of accessing each other and coming together. So I know of some doctors who have like 10 Zoom meetings or conferences in one day. So there's that balance to still make, right? Um, so thank you very much. And it's just good to know that, you know, the show must go on, especially for patient care. And you've, you've very well done that, especially maintaining quality programs. All right. Um, all right, Dr. Dr. Uh, Nassim, thank you. Someone from our audience is thanking you for your, your talk and we all appreciate um, the, all the key points about communication. Um, and there's a question here about the, that the lack of education is clearly one of the obstacles. And uh, based from your experience and your programs, what effective communication strategies could be adapted by other neighboring countries? Um, I know there was, you know, you shared quite a number of strategies, uh, but what do you find perhaps to be the most um, you know, effective or applicable among um, countries similar to yours? 
there's a, there's a lot of uh, noise. I cannot hear anything. Think. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe we can type the question in uh, in the ch the chat box if you're able to see it. Hello. Hello. Can you see the chat box, Doctor Nasim? There. We typed it in the chat box. There's a lot of noise. I, I cannot hear anything. Uh, hello, Dr. Nassim. Um, if you're able to see the chat box, there is a question about your uh, what you might recommend or what do you see as effective communication strategies that we could adapt. Uh, th there's a... There's a lot of noise I cannot hear. Okay, it's okay. Maybe we will address this question to you uh, more personally. I don't know how we'll be able to get uh, this to you, but we can try ag again after a while if you can read it in the chat box. Um, maybe for now, uh, Miss Mam says, Pahe, can you hear clearly? If Mam says in the in the room. Hello. I, Dr. Sudip, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, no, I can hear. Okay. Hello. I can hear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe it's the connection from the other end. Um Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of noise. Huh? Okay. It's okay. Can you hear me better now, Dr. Nasim? So, do you want me to answer on behalf of Dr. Nassim? Yes, maybe that would be good, Dr. Valid. Uh, yes, and like you said, we have time to answer more questions. Uh, but maybe, yes, coming from your end, what what have you found in your experience as good a, a good communication, you know, uh, strategy with patients? I, th I think Dr. Nassim has done some very innovative uh, work with her team and addressed its important we always forget as, as a high-tech professional in being in radiation oncology or medical oncology proceeding towards precision, highly precise medicine. We, we are too much engrossed into science and at times uh, may forget the patient need. So uh, looking uh, at our neighbors, uh, in Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and even up to Thailand, I've been to uh, visit uh, Ravata Bodhi and King Churadong Hospital and have been in contact with our Philippine uh, colleague, Dr. Miriam. We still uh, same, uh, face a lot of cultural challenges, which are same, but I believe understanding patients' needs is very, very important uh, here and everywhere. And then uh, we may have a different religious background, but understanding the spirituality uh, is also very, very important uh, in our cultures. We believe uh, uh, we uh, all of us are believers, uh, and that's uh, also impact the decision making. So. Uh, just posing up a plan which is very high tech or complex to the patient comprising of surgery, radiation, chemotherapy may not be very understandable uh, in one go. So we need to involve a lot of patient counselors at some point in time, uh, religious scholar or patient advocates as well. Uh, then sharing and publishing each of our experiences as Dr. Nassim did. She has uh, her own publication and she has written, written a book on it. The communication aspect is really very, very important. And uh, mainly Dr. Nassim's uh, work is been towards breast cancer, gynecological cancer patients. So another thing is that being a male dominated society in uh, South Asia, maybe some of East Asia as well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, we, we need females uh, and encouraging uh, female colleagues uh, to come forward uh, and in our medical colleges in Pakistan uh, and mentor told me that when they were in the school, school uh, all, uh, 
25 percent of the medical students would be females but when i graduated from medical school uh, 15 years ago it was the other way around most of the female uh, medical students are uh, female so we need to uh, address each and every problem individually uh, and of course uh, in an evidence-based way yes that's very true thank you thank you dr bila for for uh, addressing that question and um yes it's true one of the things that dr nasim shared is adapting now more of the adult to adult type of communication between doctors and patients rather than the adult to child type and i also recall she's saying that um we uh, to have better communication to better collaboration among professionals so um and collaboration with the patient and the family is part of the team. So again, thank you for that. Um, Ma'am Sess is back, and um, she is actually one of our nurses who have has well experienced, um, you know, advo advocating for her patients as her role as a nurse leader. And a question here is uh, from Ma'am Ma Sess: Is our nurses are our allies in patient care? Uh, may we inquire how uh -huh. organizations such as Kona evolved to be partners of doctors in healthcare and its programs for quality care. So about mom, mom says about Pona and um, how it's worked with our doctors and patients and partners. Okay, thank you for that question, Dr. Rami. Um, to give you a, a background, the uh, one of the, our founders, uh, one of the founders of the Philippine Oncology Association is a medical oncologist, Antonio Villalon, who helped us uh, uh, create linkages with other healthcare uh, professionals. Continuing so, uh, education program, um, uh, uh, program, such as chemo first, vascular access devices, and cancer updates and among others, uh, to our colleagues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. No, yes, Pona is a very strong uh, partner in, in the care of our cancer patients. and. Uh, we very well know that many um, nurse leaders really take the role, especially in supportive care. Um, I recall even in, in my further training in palliative uh, care in my diploma, my, class, my, my, my colleagues, my classmates were not just doctors. So they were nurses, there were physical therapists, and really taking on leadership roles. So thank you very much, Mamses, for sharing that. Yes. Uh, nurses are truly involved in the care, uh, in the care, and uh, in the care of cancer patients. Okay. Um, I also understand. Um, maybe with Dr. Sudip, no, the we've we've uh, learned about um, integration and um, like the recent recommendations of ASCO uh, about um, how we can integrate among resource uh, limited countries. And there were different levels depending on available resources. So, um, would you like to share a bit about how palliative care um, might have, um, you know, adapted those guidelines in your country, um, and a bit more information about resource uh, stratified guidelines and in integration? Uh, right. Uh, uh, thank you. <coughs> yeah. The, the as uh, this uh, when we oh were in God. the hello is audible I, I suppose, yes yeah. yes we can hear right, you right. and the uh, integration of palliative cure in resource limited uh, countries is very very challenging um, and when we try to find the evidence uh, during our meeting and unfortunately the, the level of evidence is so rare so we um, uh, we have to uh, okay uh, get a, a consensus among ourselves to have this um the uh, guidelines uh, come up come out for the resource limited countries for palliative care so because and uh, and sometimes most of the times uh, it is the uh, lack of uh, trained manpower 
because most of the resource limited countries there is no uh, trained uh, palliative care physician and sometimes uh, some of the countries they have to deal uh, do uh, this uh, by with the help of some nurses and in, even sometimes uh, even uh, uh, by uh, the health workers uh, very primary healthcare worker itself so we had a lot of challenges that time so uh, that time the cases uh, were um, like especially in the using the opioid uh, sometimes uh, like trained uh, nurses uh, can uh, help uh, when there is a drugs uh, doctors are not available and uh, in the, sometimes uh, this uh, job is done by primary healthcare uh, i mean uh, the simple physicians uh, with a limited uh, training uh, so the, that kind of uh, consensus we have to develop uh, during our uh, this, uh, during this uh, while we're collecting the evidence uh, during our asco uh, when we are making the guideline for this. Uh, uh, yes, hello? thank you. Yes, yeah. hello. Yes, hello. yes, truly, those were very um, helpful guidelines for us, especially in our countries where resources are limited, uh, just to um, realize that we can train a primary healthcare physicians, even nurses in the, in the grassroots uh, regarding the palliative care approach. So I believe we've also started to adapt this here in our own country as we look at the national program, reaching out to even our barangay health workers and uh, primary care health workers um, based on these guidelines that we can we can use. And so thank you very much, Dr. Sudip. And um, um, I, I believe we still have more time uh, for a few more questions. And um, I'm not sure how, Dr. Nassim, how is your connection? Can you hear us? Hello, Dr. Nassim. Maybe the the connection there is quite still quite poor. So we can go back with um, Dr. Kireshi. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, I really appreciate um, how there were many quality assurance programs in your settings and and how you even adapted like third party audit. Uh, very interesting was the community community audit as an innovative approach. Um, just wondering who would you involve in, in the community in terms of um, when you hold these types of audits? Uh, would they come from uh, what type of leaders in the community or maybe patient advocates uh, when mentioning your community audit? Hello, Dr. Reshi, I think you're still on mute. So I'm so sorry I did not unmute. That's okay. Did you hear my the question though? Yeah, I, I heard your question pretty well. Thank you. So uh, within the hospital, uh, th there are different committees uh, and uh, quality assurance groups. So the third party of uh, audit is, uh, I believe, uh, very well uh, understood. It's from organization like ISO, ISO and Joint Commission International. And within the Department uh, of Radiation Oncology and Department of Oncology, there exists a Quality Improvement Committee, which uh, itself looks at the uh, unusual appearances within the radiation therapy processes, which looks at the downtime reports of the machine, the patient satisfaction. And then there are, uh, within the hospital, the Quality Assurance Department look at uh, each of the department working and then uh, there are mock audits uh, with one department going to the other department and same examples exist for other centers in the country where, where one uh, expert from one center goes to the other center and they may uh, do an audit so i believe in the resource limited setting what i would like to propose here is not just everyone could go for national certification like iso and joint commission international because they are very expensive and uh, eventually it's the patient who pays the price uh, in, in the private setup as well as uh, even for the uh, if the government pays for these uh, audits or uh, certifications there are taxpayers money so what we propose uh, as i mentioned is to go for quality solutions without any additional investment that what we can do today with our resources to bring make the outcomes better so we can all set our standards it's all an uh, electronic uh, era right now we are now, now living 
been living in a global village everything is available on the internet google it and all the standards would be there so why not set up our own standards are uh, and then achieve them and learn from the mistakes and go on for better and higher landmarks benchmarks yes thank you thank you dr Kureshi uh, for sharing that insight about you know the cost of international uh, accreditation uh, which a lot of our countries and institutions may not afford but you know to be innovative in creating our standards and and you sharing about you know even community being innovative with getting reviews or feedback from the communities and patients uh, i think these are all part of a good plan that we can also employ um, in our setting which is resource limited um so uh, i also um want to check with dr nasim if she's still uh if she can still hear dr nasim um can you hear me hello perhaps there's still a challenge in the connection uh, but we had a re really good points uh, brought to us by dr nasim in terms of um the the models for patient and physician um, communication and um, how important it is to really educate um, our patients to give them time to 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 ask the questions and not to interfere in the conversation. Um, all right, I guess we enter session for this evening. I want to thank everyone um, from um, Ses and I from Manila all the way to Pakistan and Nepal. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you Hope to visit you Thank one of these days. Who knows? Oh, please, please, <laughs> most welcome. So, Thank you. I'd love to David. welcome you. It was very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mamses. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Rami.